Welcome to the Dough Roller Money Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Berger. Today in episode 317, we're going to do no less than fight for the financial soul of America. How did this come about? Well, it's kind of a story. So I want to tell you about it. And uh, there we go. So let's get started. Question. There are a lot of personal finance gurus out there. I don't consider myself one of them. I don't know. Maybe I am. But in any event, I'm thinking more like Dave Ramsey, Suze Orman, uh, David Bach, maybe even Tony Robbins, who's you know written a book on money. There's one thing that I think all of these individuals have in common. They have a lot of things not in common, right? I think uh, Orman invests mainly in bonds, at least at one time she did. Dave Ramsey, I think, only invests in stocks. Uh, some invest in index funds, some actively managed funds. But there's one thing that I think they all have in common. Any idea what it is? I think they all believe that we have significant control, not complete control, but significant control over our financial destiny, right? We can control, again, not completely. There are going to be things that happen outside of our control. That's just life. But that by and large, uh, most if not all of us have a significant amount of control over our financial future. I think they all believe that in one way or another. They may express it differently. They, differ, they, ha, they, they each have different shticks and, you know, some have the baby steps and some have the automatic millionaire and, you know, whatever. They come at it from different, in different ways. But I think they all believe that basic foundational thing, that we have significant control over our finances. But here's the thing. Not everyone agrees with that. And I think there are those, I'll call them personal finance guru haters. Um, maybe that's too strong of a word. Maybe not. And I'm not talking about folks that maybe don't like a specific personality. Maybe you're just not a, I don't know, a Dave Ramsey fan or, or a Norman fan or whatever. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about people that generally just think the, the personal finance advice industry is a scam. I think they all have something in common too, right? And that's sort of the opposite of what I just described, that we have limited control over our financial future, often because they view the system, whatever that might mean, as rigged, right? That, that, the, that the, the cards are stacked against them, uh, against a, a large portion of our society, that uh, because of systemic issues we really don't have, or a lot of people don't. If you're rich, you do, you know, whatever that might mean, the 1%, whatever. Uh, but if you're not in that sort of elite group, uh, the system is really uh, designed to keep you down. And uh, so they kind of shut off anything that a Dave Ramsey or a David Bach or whatever would have to say. And I, what I've noticed is they tend to raise the same issues such as um, lack of unions, a wage stagnation, income inequality, uh, a lack of a, of a higher minimum wage, uh, maybe the crushing student debt, the, the, you know, we know uh, that issue and how, how it affects so many people. So these are, are real issues, right? Um, and they see those, uh, though, beyond just a sort of a national political landscape. They see it as affecting one's ability to do the things that the personal finance gurus say you can do. And I've seen this struggle play out really over the last 10 years, but it seems to have, in my mind anyway, maybe I've just focused on it more, just maybe it's just been the articles that I've been reading. They seem to, it, it seems to have kind of come to a head and there's this tension uh, between these two, two groups. And I think it's important enough, well, to talk about on this show. Uh, and, and I think as someone who's about to be a published author, uh, and of course I do the podcast here and I write still some, uh, I think it's one of the most important issues, right? If we lose this fight, now you probably know where I stand on this. I think, I think most people do have a, a lot more control, I'll put it this way, have a lot more control over their financial future than they think they do. Uh, to me, this is one of the most important fights that we must, we, we must win. Because, uh, one, I think it's, it's, 
it's right. I think we do have a, a lot of control of our financial future. We don't have complete control. And yes, there are things uh, beyond our control, including systemic things, many of the things I listed, that can have an impact on you or me. Uh, I, I don't think it changes the fact that we do have significant control over our financial future. But if, we, if, we, if we're convinced that we don't, or if, if for those that are convinced that they don't, why try? Right, what, there's, they lose hope. Um, why try to improve? You, you know, you're just you're just going to end up losing to the system. Now, uh, how do we address the, all this that I've just described to you in one, you know, twenty or thirty minute podcast? Well, I guess we're going to find out. Here's the interesting thing: where I see this come to a head is often in the latte factor. Kind of funny that that seems to be the thing that people gravitate to to fight about. Uh, and as I mentioned, I think in the last show, the subtitle of my book, Retire Before Mom and Dad, was going to be, or at least one that I was considering, Freedom First, Latte Second. And the folks in the Facebook group, almost uniformly, I don't know if there was anyone that liked that subtitle. They hated it. Now, I don't know if it was because they were just sick of hearing about it or, you know, maybe it was some other issues. But what I've seen is that the latte factor has a tendency to bring out from both sides, both the you can control your financial destiny, your financial future group, and the no, you can't, the system is rigged against you group, seems to come to a head with the latte factor. I don't know, I guess I have an idea of why we're going to talk about it, but in my mind, it seems somewhat kind of funny that it's the latte factor, you know, that's the battleground. That's where, that's where the two factions meet to, to duke it out. But that, that seems to be uh, the one place where I see it the most. So um, how are we going to tackle this issue and, and why did it come up? Well, let me show you, first of all, why it came up. I was reading an article. It's this article here by someone that I don't know. Whoops, here we go. It's this article by Kishana Kali. Um, it's published on GQ. The personal finance industry is a scam. And for those of you not watching the video, it's got a picture of Suze or Orman in, uh, in a giant coffee cup, <laughs> which is kind of a funny picture. And um, it's an article about uh, some advice that she recently gave. And the advice was on CNBC. And here's the video. Uh, Suze Orman, how your daily coffee habit is costing you $1 million. So if you Google that, you'll see, you'll see the video. I watched it. And uh, if you Google the personal finance industry is a scam, you'll find the article on GQ. We're going to talk about this, but um, this is just one of many articles that I've come across recently uh, where this sort of, this battleground takes place. Uh, and um, there's a number of things I want to cover about it uh, because I think it's critically important that we come out on the right side of this debate. More importantly, that we convince as many other people as we can to come out on the right side of this uh, debate. And so I want to begin with sort of the nuts and bolts of the latte factor. And in this article on GQ, um, the author, rightly so, criticized some of the assumptions that Suze Orman was making. So what Suze Orman did was she said, look, if you take, a, she assumed $100 a month uh, spent on coffee. And if you took that money and you instead invested it and earned a 12% return, after 40 years, you'd have a million bucks. All right, now let's just, let's stop there for a moment. Let's first, let's check that out. Is that right? So let's go over to our friendly Google spreadsheet, sheets.google.com. And uh, let's see if I get this formula right. I'm going to type it in. So it's an equal sign, FV for future value. Open the print. The first thing is the interest rate. So we'll put 0.12. You could also just put, by the way, 12%. Um, and we're going to divide it by 12 because I want to do this on a monthly basis. And comma, right? And then we need the time period. So it's going to be 40 years. So I'll put 40 in and then times 12. That way I don't have to do the math. And then what are we going to contribute each month? 100 bucks. I do it as a negative number because it's sort of uh, money going out, if you will, although it's going out to your investment account. And this should work. There we go. Yep, $1,176, uh, 
let me try that again. It's early. Uh, $1,176,477. And for those counting at home, 25 cents. So yeah, we get actually a little bit more than a million. Um, now, uh, in the GQ article, uh, this was criticized. And I think for good reason. 12% is a ridiculous assumption. A ridiculous assumption. Now, it wasn't the only reason the author criticized it. She also criticized it because it was over a 40-year period, and for all we know, none of us are going to live 40 years. Let me, let me address that one first. Yeah, compounding takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. I, I think the notion that you might not live to be 40 years, while true, kind of irrelevant. I mean, does that mean we shouldn't save and invest? I don't think so. Um, you might live more than 40 years. Uh, and the reality is compounding takes time. That's not a function of the latte factor. That's just a function of math. You know, it's, it, that definitely falls into something you can't control. You can't control, for the most part, whether you're, you're going to live 40 years or not, right? No, tomorrow is promised to no person. Um, and compounding is math. It, you know, you can't change it any more than you can change gravity. So uh, that's kind of an easy one. But the 12%, I think is an absolutely valid criticism. And frankly, I'm, I'm kind of just tired of the f personal finance gurus assuming 12% because it's stupid. How do you like that? That was pretty articulate. It was stupid. I mean, it's just, it's just a silly assumption. And it's, it's kind of the softball that gives people a very easy way to complain about what you've just done. Uh, and, you know, the long-term stock returns are just not 12%. Yes, over periods of time it is. Um, some people will point to this mutual fund or that mutual fund that over some period of time has earned 12% fine. Um, still not a, a, a good reason to make an, use that assumption for, for planning purposes or in this case for um, trying to persuade people that they should save money rather than buy coffee, right? And here's my concern. It's not this particular article or video from Suze Orman or this particular article on GQ or even this particular podcast, but it's that when a personal finance guru makes that assumption and then you have articles that rightly call it out, my concern is folks that aren't living and breathing this stuff every day, like I am and like maybe you are, are going to read it and, be, and just sort of dismiss it out of hand. Oh, yes, that's a silly assumption. I agree. Who earns 12%? And they just throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, that's the mistake. Uh, because the fact of the matter is the latte factor, which is really nothing more than compounding small amounts of money invested over time, um, is magic. It's a beautiful thing. And it works even if you don't earn 12%. Obviously, the numbers will be different, of course. And let's take a look at it. So in this case, I've assumed 12%. Let's just copy this Let's move it over here. Let's assume 11%. What do you think the difference will be? It's just 1%. Wow. From 1.176 million down to 860,000, from, just from going from 12% to 11%. Yeah, uh, the percent matters a lot. By the way, keep that in mind if you're paying an, an investment advisor 1% in fees. All right. Let's assume 10%. Drops that out, drops almost by to half of the original value. It's down to 632000 In my book, Retire Before Mom and Dad, which, by the way, making great progress, got the cover done, as you know. Um, we're in the sort of the final round of, we're, we're in the process of editing the layout of the book. So getting close. Anyway, I assume 9.3%. And I assume 9.3% because that's, been the return over the last roughly 100 years of a 70-30 portfolio, and now we're down to $511,000. So we're now below half of the, of the original um, number, even though we've only gone from a 12% return to a 9.3% return. Um, again, compounding, <laughs> the, the numbers you get, whether good or bad, can be surprising because of the effects of compounding. But here's the thing. 100 bucks a month turning into 500 grand now. The other thing we haven't counted on is inflation, right? And 40 years from now is, is a long time, right? If you think in the past 40 years ago, what, Carter was president. So 40 years is a long time. But we're also not increasing the contributions by inflation either. We're assuming $100 a month for 40 years. You know, just to kind of keep the math simple, 
We're, we're not trying to uh, calculate to the penny someone's retirement plan here, right? We're just trying to understand the effects of long-term saving of relatively small amounts of money. And to me, you can assume a more realistic return and still see big numbers. And that's really all you need to do to, to, to make the point. So when someone like Suze Orman assumes 12%, she's doing far more harm, uh, in my view, th than she is good or helping people. And by the way, those that kind of accept it because they don't know any better, and there's plenty of folks that fall into that category, um, could end up being sorely disappointed <laughs> long term. So, th you know, we need to think, um, I guess, rationally, realistically about these numbers. They matter, right? This isn't just sitting around debating what we think returns will be over the next 20 or 30 years. And you have an opinion and I have an opinion and Suze Orman has an opinion. Fine. Who cares, right? This is folks, you know, setting assumptions or in some cases pointing out just how, how silly the assumption is. And, and as a result, just basically disregarding everything in this case that Suze Orman had to say, which you know, again, the fundamental thing she's trying to communicate is really important. She's doing it in a way that makes it easy for people to dismiss it out of hand. That's what the GQ article does. Not just for this reason, by the way, for other reasons as well that we'll get to. But there's no reason to do that. There's no reason to make that assumption just so you can have a round million dollar number. Who cares? That, um, so now having said all of that, folks need to stop whining about it. I, and this is this is my tough love moment. Yeah, twelve percent is silly, but don't whine about it, right? Change the assumption. I just showed you how in a spreadsheet. It ain't difficult. Maybe you think nine point three percent is ridiculous. You maybe maybe I don't know. Maybe, maybe after this podcast you won't. But maybe you'll read my book, and maybe you'll say, Rob, nine point three is silly. It's seven percent. We all know that. All right, fine. Run your own numbers with seven percent. You're not going to offend me. Don't whine about it, right? And when I read articles in GQ, it's like, yeah, just change the assumption, point out, you know, well, let's use realistic numbers. She kind of did that, by the way. She did point out that most folks assume 7 to 10%, and if you assume somewhere in there, it's going to add about another decade before you reach a million. I think it's a valid point. Yes, it will. In fact, we can look at the numbers. If we assume 9.3%, uh, and we, how far would we have to go? I did this calculation earlier. I think it's 49 years. Yeah, 49 years would get us almost the same number at 9.3% that 40 years will get you at, um, uh, at 12%. So valid point. It, 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 doesn't, it, it doesn't do anything, though, of course, to change the underlying point that Orman was trying to make uh, with her 12% assumption, and that is, Saving small amounts of money over time, even assuming what I believe are realistic return assumptions, generates a pile of cash. I mean, that's just, that's math. We can't hate it, I don't think, in any event. All right, so that's sort of the, the nuts and bolts of the latte factor and this issue, uh, I think a valid issue, about how Suze Orman approached it with her 12%. But there's a lot more going on here. I think the, the most... Uh, important thing that the latte factor does for us is that it takes away excuses. And I think that's why some people um, love it and some people hate it. For some people, it's empowering. Wow. I can, I can make a real difference in my life with relatively small amounts of money. Forget the coffee for a moment. Maybe you don't give up the latte. Maybe you give up something else. Maybe you, you, the car you buy, you get a cheaper one, or the house you get, you get a smaller one, you know, whatever. It's empowering. I can make a real difference to my life and my family's life with relatively small amounts of money. And I think other people absolutely hate it. And they hate it because deep down it takes away excuses. And they don't want to give up their coffee or their five streaming services uh, or they don't want to buy a, a less expensive car or get a, um, a, a smaller uh, place. Or some people hate it, maybe, because at that moment in their lives, they truly don't have any money to spare. They're not going to Starbucks every day. They're just trying to fight for survival. Now, that's a good reason to maybe, I can understand that, why, why this kind of personal finance guru advice would rub you the wrong way. 
uh, although hating it's probably not going to help you any. Every situation is different, and you know it's 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 sometimes just not helpful to generalize. Uh, but the fact is, the latte factor. T- I, I put it this way: it takes away excuses for a large portion of our population. Not everyone. There's no question that some people are in situations that uh, the latte factor concept is just not going to help, right? Um, but for a large portion of, I think, our population, it takes away excuses. And some people don't want those excuses taken away. Uh, and I think that's really where the rubber meets the road. And the question is, for you and me, where, where are you in, in that continuum? Uh, for me, it, 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 it was liberating. Uh, and it, it is now, even though, you know, uh, I'm a, a bit older and in a different sort of financial stage of my life, I use the latte factor every day. The last episode was on my cash back strategy and how I'm investing it in Berkshire Hathaway stock. That's the latte factor. It's got nothing to do with coffee, uh, but it, it does have everything to do with saving relatively small amounts of money consistently over time. And uh, I find it to be uh, very empowering. I hope you do too. I think that's the message that we need to be uh, conveying for those of us um, in the business of publishing content, whether it's a podcast, a video, whatever, publishing content uh, about personal finance. All right. Now, one issue that came up in the article was this idea of shaming that uh, Suze Orman is shaming people about their coffee habit. I've heard this before. Actually, I think, I think my daughter tried this on me. I think she was joking. Um, when we were talking about how she spends her money and uh, I kind of shot back at her right away. I said, look, I'm not telling you not to go to Sonic three times a week. What I am telling you is there are consequences for doing it, and you need to know what those are. That's it. Um, But here's something else, and it's deeper. You can't spend money on coffee and streaming services and eating out uh, and whatever else, and at the same time, tell yourself you just can't save. You don't have the money. That's just not true. And this is where it goes back to the no excuses. I find that liberating. I find that empowering. I have control. I may choose to spend money rather than save it, but that's just it. It's my choice. And it's your choice. And I'm not here to tell you how to spend your money. Uh, I am here to encourage folks to save money. Uh, So, But ultimately, each decision is our own. I don't view that as shaming at all. Uh, I suppose some could communicate it in a way where some would see it that way, and I get that. Particularly, you know, the Ormans and the Ramses, you know, they're sort of the, I don't know, tough love. They got a shtick. I guess we all have a shtick. I'm, uh, but <laughs> theirs is a, a particular shtick that I can see why some people might view it that way. But my, my take on that is you got to get over it. Because at the end of the day, what matters isn't what they say whether you think they're shaming you or not, what matters is what you do with the information and the choices and decisions you make. That's what matters. Uh, And yeah, so there you go. Now, underlying all of this is one, I think, important, important point to be made. I am confident, I don't know this, I'm gonna go on the limb, I'm confident that those gurus, myself included, if I'm a guru, I don't really think I am, but to talk about the latte factor, didn't build their wealth by avoiding coffee. Now, I can't speak for Dave Ramsey or a Suze Orman or a David Bach. It may be that they've never had a cup of coffee in their life, and they take $4 every day and put it in a jar, and at the end of the month, invest it wherever they invest their money. That could be. But I'm going to guess that most of the folks that preach the latte factor didn't actually become wealthy by avoiding Starbucks, right? Uh, and I think that can be, that, that's something that needs to be acknowledged, right? Um, 
But here's the thing. Many of them, I can't speak for them you know, as a group, but I think many of them did become wealthy by avoiding some expenses that others uh, routinely incur, right? That's certainly true for us. I mean, we lived well below our means. I remember I wanted a car. We we're going to go out and buy a new car. And I forget what I wanted. I'm trying to remember. This was a long, long time ago. What I wanted, by the way, was not a fancy car at all. Um, but it was nicer than what my wife thought we could afford. And I let her, I let, I let her ultimately decide what we were going to get. This was my car, the one I was going to drive. But I just let her, you, you can pick it. So I ended up getting a Ford Escort. And it was a stick shift. Which I wasn't really good at. I mean, I could I could drive a, a stick, but I, you know, I'm not an expert at it. So it was, <laughs> it was some rough going to begin with. This was well, maybe I don't know how long ago this was. Twenty years ago, um, and it had it, it didn't have power windows. I mean, this was bare bones. And I remember we were waiting for them to get the because we basically asked them Ford dealership, what's the cheapest car you've got on the lot? It was a new car. It was a new car. I guess we could have gone used, but what's the cheapest car you, you've got on the lot? And it took them like a half hour to get the car because it was like in the back and there were all these other cars around it because, you know, I don't know, they figured no one would ever buy this thing. So they had to move all these cars and they finally bring out this red Ford Escort. And, um, and that's what I drove for a number of years. And it was much uh, less expensive than what I would have bought if, if, if I had made the decision. Um, that's the latte factor, right? That's I'm sure we financed it, although I don't remember this, but I'm sure we did back then. Uh, but, but that was a much lower monthly payment because we got a much less expensive car than I would have purchased. That's the latte factor, right? So in our case, I can't say that avoiding Starbucks is what helped us um, achieve whatever you know financial success we've achieved. But I can say that the latte factor in principle has absolutely had a huge impact. And that's really the thing about the latte factor. The latte factor isn't about coffee. Um, and it's also not about never buying things that are non-essential that you might enjoy, right? Whether it's coffee or whatever it is. Um, that's one of the reasons in the in the original subtitle of my book, it wasn't the latte factor. It was freedom first, latte second. Uh, buy your freedom first, then enjoy whatever it is uh, that you enjoy. And that's effectively what my wife and I are doing with that car. Now, one could argue we could have tried to figure out how to live on one with one car, and maybe that maybe we could have. Uh, but still, we ended up buying a, a, a car a, a car at a certain level, even though we could have afforded. A more expensive car, but we chose not to because we wanted to buy our freedom, and then maybe, if if we wanted to, get a nice car, right? So, um, that's really I think a really important thing to acknowledge. I don't think these financial gurus made their money by avoiding coffee. But so what? So what? The latte factor is still real. The, Im the implications of it are still real. Uh, and you can still use it uh, in your own finances to improve uh, and to save more and to build wealth. And you can use it in ways that have nothing to do with coffee. All right. One last thing, and I appreciate your patience. This is a slightly different kind of show, I suppose, than what I normally do. But I, th it's just, I think this is such an important issue. And I think it's going to become, I try to avoid politics in this show because it's not a political show. But this issue is front and center um, in, 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 in politics uh, and your views on the government and what we should do to help people, what we shouldn't do to help people. But in the GQ article, there was a lot of discussion about income inequality, wage stagnation. Um, I think, yeah, student debt was in there. Uh, Deunionization, the lack of union jobs. Now, these are all uh, issues, you know, front and center, particularly as we, we move towards the next presidential election. A lot of these will be issues that the various candidates might have proposals to address. Uh, and you may have, these may be issues that you, you feel strongly about on one side or the other. In my case, some of them I feel strongly about, some of them I don't. I have, you know, different views depending on the issue. Uh, uh, but, but here's the thing. 
as important as they are, particularly at a national level for our country, they've really got nothing to do with your and my daily decisions, right? Could they impact us? Depends on what the issue is. Perhaps they do. But we can't use them as excuses to make bad financial decisions, right? Wage stagnation's got nothing to do with whether you get a cup of coffee every morning before you go to work or how many streaming services you have or the, 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 the type of car you buy if you get one at all. Those are decisions you and I make, and we should own those decisions and hopefully make good ones, right? I try to. I don't always succeed. I'm sure you do too. These are, are important national issues, and we're going to hear more about them over the next two years as we move towards the election or, or year and a half. But they got really very little to do with the latte factor. They've got very little to do with the daily financial decisions you and I make. So let's not use them as a scapegoat to justify bad decisions we might make. They got nothing to do with our daily lives and the decisions that we make. I shouldn't say nothing to do. That may be too extreme, but very little to do. They may impact us in some way. Maybe if, if, if there were more unions, you or I would make more money. All right, let's just assume that's true. Now what do we do? We still got to make daily decisions about how we spend our money, right? And we shouldn't confuse the two. They're, 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 they're different. Uh, and we shouldn't use them to argue that the latte factor is of little value. It's just they're, they're, they're two different things. And um, I don't mean to, to you know, I, th this was the issue, one of the issues raised in the GQ article, but the fact of the matter is I've seen it over and over and over and over again uh, in article after article after article. And I th we need to stand up against that and fight it. Important issues, yes. Important to our daily financial decisions and how we choose to save and invest our money, not, not so much, no. So that's my show for today. I would welcome your comments, even if they're not, I started to say even if they're not kind. Well, I hope they're kind, but disagree with me. Maybe you think, pick an issue. Income inequality has a huge impact on our daily decisions and whether we decide to get a coffee every day or streaming services or how many cars we own or how big a house we get. Maybe you think it's an absolutely, uh, there's a critical connection between those two. I'd love to hear it. Maybe you think the latte factor is, is ridiculous and worthless. Tell me. Shoot me an email, drdoorroller.net. Um, join the Facebook group, doorroller.net slash Facebook group, and leave your comments there. I really do want to hear them. I've, 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 um, I've started to use Twitter in this way. I'm not a big Twitter person. I had a Twitter account as part of Door Roller. I then started my own personal Twitter account, um, and I've got, I think, 160 followers. Not very many people. Um, but I'm not on Twitter all day, but every now and again, I'll get on there and um, I'll ask questions because I want to I want to understand how other people think through an issue. I did this as a lawyer regularly because, you know, you're dealing with juries and judges and uh, they they see issues some, many times differently uh, than I might. I'll give you an example. Uh, before we close the show, I was on a jury the week of 9-11. Can you believe that? So 9-11 was on a Tuesday. Uh, so Monday, um, I'm, I'm called in for jury duty. I go in. At that point, I was still a trial lawyer. I'm confident I'll be in there for an hour, and they'll excuse me because all trial lawyers know you don't put lawyers on a jury. So it's a med mal, medical malpractice case. And you know they're going around the room asking everyone what they do. And I say, yeah, I'm a trial lawyer. And I, like, I, I basically almost turn to walk out of the, out of, out of the courtroom, assuming that they'll, someone will object. They put me on the jury. And then, the, then, so, of course, we're dismissed on Tuesday. We come back Wednesday. Um, the trial lasts a week. We deliberate on Friday. I'm elected as the, the, the foreman of the jury <laughs> by the other jurors, of course, because I'm the lawyer. I know what I'm doing, right? So uh, the, the plaintiff had had a, a, a massive heart attack. Now, he survived, and by all accounts, there was no permanent injury. But... Um, he was suing uh, the doctors and whatnot, and, you know, I won't get into the details, but uh, th there was rel relatively little evidence on damages, other than the fact that who wants to have a, a, a massive heart attack? That in and of itself is, is damages. But it wasn't, there was no, no evidence that, for example, that he lost wages, uh, that he'd been out of work, 
you know, that kind of thing. So we go to deliberate and, and, you know, we're back and forth and some people wanted to give them millions because they hate the insurance industry. And that doesn't surprise me that, you know, that, that, that's kind of, I think, a normal reaction. But then someone said, well, we also should compensate them for, you know, the impact this had on his sex life. And I'm, th- I'm going back in my mind, I don't remember that being in evidence. I don't think that question was asked of anybody. So I said, well, wait a minute. Who says his sex life was all that good to begin with? I think that's a valid question. One of the things that taught me was I can't ever predict how people will think about an issue. Because <laughs> I got to be honest, that question would have never crossed my mind. Well, um, I do the same thing on Twitter, not so much about that issue, but I asked a question about Elizabeth Warren's proposal to tax uh, those with more than $50 million in assets, I think it's 2% a year or whatever, and take that money and pay off up to $50,000 in school loans uh, for, for, you know, for folks that, have, I guess, have graduated from college. And I didn't state an opinion, uh, my view on it, uh, but I did ask about it. You know, and I said, you know, look, I, gr- I understand what it's like to have school loans. I graduated in 92 with $55,000 in school loans. That was almost 30 years ago, so that would certainly be six figures in today's dollars. You know, and it took me years to pay it off. But, you know, why, why is it a good idea for the government to take money from one group, even if they're wealthy, and pay off the debts of another group? And I, and, and I got a lot of reactions to it. And it was interesting to see the reactions, because just like being on jury duty and, and, and having that question raised that I would have never thought of, I got a lot of responses that I would have never, never thought of. Right? It, it never would have occurred to me. And I learned a lot. I don't know that it necessarily changed my views, but it certainly broadened my thinking on that issue. Uh, and uh, so in this case, back to our topic of our show, the latte factor revisited, if you will, um, I really want to hear your thoughts on this. Because I think this issue, how much control do we really have over our finances? I think there are a lot of people that believe we have very little. And we, we have very little because the system, whatever that might mean for them, uh, is just sort of stacked against the little guy. Now, mind you, you may, it may be that the system is stacked against the little guy. Let's assume that to be true. That doesn't necessarily mean it affects our ability to control our financial future. But some people think that you may think that. And I'd really like to hear from you. This is genuine. I'd like to get a, a full sense of this issue. So again, drdorler.net uh, or, and or join the Facebook group, uh, uh, dorler.net slash Facebook group. Well, thanks for listening. Thanks for hearing me out on this, what I think is a critical issue. And by the way, I also think um, it will come up when people read my book, Retire Before Mom and Dad. We'll see. Hey, hope you have a great week. Until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom.